Hi everyone and uh, welcome back to the Australian Reptile Park. Jake and Zach here. Now it's Wednesday, uh, which means we are back with Elvis, our large resident male saltwater crocodile. Now for the last two weeks we've attempted to uh, demonstrate a death roll with Elvis, which hasn't quite gone to plan, but uh, that happens when you work with animals. Sometimes things don't quite go as you imagine. Um, so today we are just going to go with a standard feed like we would typically do uh, during one of our public presentations here at the park. Now, our crocodile feeding is undoubtedly the most popular uh, presentation that we put on here at the park. It attracts a lot of people and as you can imagine, um, it's very exciting for the average person to see a saltwater croc uh, extend out of the water and grab a bit of food. That's what we try and demonstrate during our demonstrations is that uh, ambush from the water's edge that a saltwater crocodile has been doing for a very, very long time. Now, I'm gonna feed Elvis uh, pretty well straight away here today and then uh, we'll talk a lot more about him toward the end. So for now, uh, I'm gonna head over to the water's edge. I'll take one of these bits of food with me and uh, we'll see how we go. Now you can come with me um, as we go along. Elvis is gonna uh, come to the water's edge here and he'll do that because I'm sending out vibrations. Crocodiles are incredibly sensitive. They have tiny pressure receptors right along their body. And this is basically gonna draw Elvis right to this spot. This is simulating an animal, a prey animal, that would be coming down to the water's edge in the wild to take a drink. Alright. Now, you saw that uh, initial strike. He came about a third of the way out of the water. And then he put on that big uh, sideward action of the head. Brought those jaws together, which created that jaw pop. And that's that sound we heard. That's three and a half thousand pounds per square inch closing jaw pressure coming together. Now you can see he extends back into the water to swallow that little bit of food. And that is exactly what you would do even if you were to grab a large mammal. In the wild, a saltwater croc this size would not be feeding on a small bit of chicken like we're feeding here today. He would be feeding on a kangaroo, wallaby, water buffalo. He's going to drag that animal back into the water and then he'll very simply drown it. Now I'm going to bring him around here now to this slightly shallower part of the pool. We can come out a little bit now. And uh, what we're going to do is try and demonstrate a thing called a tail walk. That is where a crocodilian will extend their body up and out of the water. And they do this using their thick muscular tail. Their tail is really their driving force. It's what they'll use to propel themselves out of the water's edge, but also what they'll utilise in order to extend their body out of the water. Now they do this more so when they're young. As you can imagine, smaller crops, they're feeding on smaller food items. So that to start out life, they'd be feeding on small water birds, maybe turtles, fruit bats, Things that may be hanging over the water's edge. And as a result, they are very good at extending their body up and out of the water, which we're going to try and demonstrate for you here now. So we've seen the food. We like this corner here where it is slightly deeper. I think we're going to get someone else. See him using those front feet. He's basically standing up right now on his feet, not even really using his tail. Uh, so one more tail, that's good. Try and get one more out of him, you can have it this time. All right. Now get him nice and close as he, as he swallows that bit of food, because you'll notice he lifts the head up and out of the water. Now he's swallowed it, and uh, we've got one more bit of food for him. Here quite a big bit and what I want to try and do is lift that head a little bit for you. You can lift his head about level with mine. Alright, now I might get you to hop out of there in a second. Alright, no, we're good, we're good. He's going to spoil that bit of food and ideally he'll head back into the water. Alright, a bit of burp at the end there, that's alright. And now we can see him reversing back into the water. You often hear uh, people say that crocodiles cannot move uh, backwards, they can only come forward. That's, as we can see here, uh, certainly not true. He is a very, very impressive animal. Probably that 
second to last uh, jaw pop we heard there was the best one today. And I think I it's actually been the best one in the last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. And uh, as I mentioned, that is the strongest bite force of any animal on the face of the planet. So um, if we were to compare it to something like a, you know, a hippopotamus or a tiger or a, tiger or a lion, um, it's typically about three or four times the closing bite force of those animals. Now, saltwater crocodiles are one of about 27 species of crocodilian found right throughout the world. Um, they are the largest, so they do occur here in Australia and also throughout uh, much of Southeast Asia. A really big male could get over six metres in length and weigh over a thousand kilos in weight. So they are a very, very large animal. If we compare that to, uh, say, a Chinese alligator, a Cuban croc, uh, any of your African dwarf crocs, they tend to be far, far smaller around the five to six foot range. But then we do also have certain species like Indian gharial, uh, false gharial, that can get almost as large as the saltwater crocs. So the crocodilians are incredibly variable in terms of size, but the saltwater croc does get the largest. Now, they are also one of the most feared, and there's good reason for that. As we can see, they are incredibly dangerous, uh, but more so when people make the mistake of entering the water. This is not an animal that's going to leave the water, walk up onto land 100 metres, grab someone and take them back. They are waiting for someone to make that mistake of entering the water or perhaps fishing too close to the water's edge. Any of those things um, put you in that potential prey category. You're coming down to the water's edge just like a kangaroo or a wallaby would. And therefore, uh, that crocodile may act on instinct, grab you and uh, take you in. So it's a very important reminder and we saw a good reminder today as to why you should not go swimming or even go, go near the water's edge in the northern parts of the country uh, where this species occurs. Now if you're wondering more specifically where they occur, um, you're talking about really from Mackay in central Queensland uh, or central coastal Queensland up into the Cape and then right across the top end and down into WA. If you do not find this species in the cooler parts of the country, they are strictly found in those northern tropical regions in both salt and fresh water. That's a bit of a myth, they're called the saltwater croc, but um, they do actually spend most of their time in freshwater rivers. They're called a saltwater croc because they are extremely tolerant of salt water and they can occasionally go right out into the ocean if they need to. But most of the time they're hanging out in those dark, brown, murky, freshwater billabongs, uh, creeks and rivers. So that's where you really need to be. Uh, wise when you're in crop country. So we've got a few questions coming yeah. through. That vocalization that he's done, it sounded a bit like a burp. Yeah. Um, what kind of vocalizations can people expect from a saltwater crocodile? Uh, typically not too many. Um, when they're communicating with each other, and we're still learning um, a lot about this, it's, it's fairly recent research, um, there is all kinds of vocalizations and things they'll do beneath the surface to communicate with one another. It's incredibly fascinating. Um, but in terms of what you may be able to hear with the human ear, um, typically you might hear a growl from a really angry croc. Um, typically you'll hear that if you were to be catching up a croc, moving it around, um, then you might hear a typical big male salty growl. Um, but occasionally they do those burp-like sounds um, after they've fed, just like a, a human would. How did Elvis come to being at the Australian Reptile Park? So Elvis is a wild caught croc. He was caught up in Darwin Harbour uh, back in the early 2000s. So he's been here at the park since 2007. Um, but prior to that, he was in a crocodile farm for a number of years. And essentially what happened, um, he was almost banished to the, the back of the croc farm. He was really no use to them. And that is because he was not interested in breeding with female crocs. He was um, obviously a, a lonesome uh, bachelor male in the wild and he wanted to remain that way in captivity. They attempted to introduce females to Elvis, he killed them. He just wanted to be in a water body by himself. We were fortunately able to bring him down here, as I mentioned, in 2007. And uh, since then, he's been living here uh, in his own pond alone. And uh, I think he's pretty happy here. So we've seen a few of his um, feeding techniques. In the wild, What? how does that differ to a captive situation? So of course, in the wild, um, they are feeding on a live prey animal. Now, mammals, particularly those with four legs, um, are very athletic, very agile. And so a saltwater crocodile has to be extremely self stealthy and extremely quick when it comes to putting on that initial strike and that initial ambush. Um, because of course, if he misses first go, that animal is going to be gone, <laughs> way off uh, into the bush, and that croc has missed his opportunity. So what they will typically do is spend a number of days or weeks um, in a particular region that they've noticed that um, 
prey animals are coming down to the water's edge to take a drink. They will then uh, sit there very stealthily and just wait for that perfect opportunity, wait for perhaps a sick or injured animal, a complacent animal that sticks its head in that water a little bit too long, and then they will strike out, grab it, rip it into the water, and as I mentioned, they very simply drown it. Now, if they've grabbed an animal that's over 50 kilos, typically, um, they can't eat that, that whole food item. Um, so what they do, they'll either death roll, like we didn't see Elvis do, or they'll also put on a big head shake where they'll lift the head out of the water, they shake the food item from side to side in the hopes that it rips a, a fairly large chunk off, but a chunk that they can swallow quite easily. And then they just simply allow the rest of that food item to flow down the river and that will actually uh, feed that entire ecosystem. You're going to have other smaller crops that may feed on that prey item, fish, um, any of your, your water dwelling things that would be feeding on meat are probably going to take advantage of that uh, large food item. So crocodiles, whilst they are incredibly dangerous, they are also incredibly important in our ecosystems. They are what we call a keystone species and if you remove crocodiles from your ecosystems, what happens, you'll have a total collapse of that ecosystem just because they are so important. Talking about complacency, <laughs> Elvis is playing a little bit of cat and mouse with us at the moment. Obviously, he's smart enough and has the wherewithal to understand that our focus isn't on him at all times. That's why we have Zach and extra spotters watching. Are they smart animals? Can he read what we're doing? They're, they're incredibly smart and uh, it's a bit interesting to say that because their thumb, oh, sorry, their uh, brain is only about the size of your thumb. So they have an extremely small brain, um, but they use a lot of it. So they are um, extremely intelligent and they've been around for a very, very long time. Um, about 260 million years for crocodil crocodilians as a whole. Um, and in this form we see here today, about 65 million years. So they are very, very good at doing what they do. They've been doing it for an extremely long time. And as you can see, he's been a little bit cheeky there. He's noticed that typically I'm facing him. I can see what he's doing. Now that I've got my back turned to the croc, he thinks he might be able to sneak up a little bit. Now, fortunately, that's the, that's the reason we have spotters watching my back. Um, but if I was alone in here and I were to do that, that would be extremely dangerous because um, he is just going to sneak up very, very slowly. I may not notice that. And uh, that is, whilst he is a captive croc, that is exactly what they do out in the wild. They are very sneaky and will uh, basically creep up very, very slowly on a potential food item. What are the uses for the bumps on his back? So those are called what we call osteoderms or scoots. And they're basically hard bony plates. Um, a lot of reptiles will have osteoderms, uh, tiny bits of bone beneath the scale, but in the crocodilians they are really fantastic because what they do is actually create currents and countercurrents beneath the surface which cancel each other out and that allows a 450 kilo croc like we have here to move just a few inches below the surface and they will not make a single disturbance. Again, a very efficient way of sneaking up on a potential food item. He can move around, you know, he's about four and a half meters long, maybe 4.6, about 450 kilos. He could move beneath the surface in water, maybe two foot deep, completely unnoticed. Now, of course, we've got uh, nice clear water here and makes it a little safer for us. But if this were brown, murky water, you would never know that a big male saltwater croc was sitting right in front of you until, of course, it's way too late. And that is what they are relying on in the wild. So we saw him do a few jump techniques. Um, what kind of prey are they trying to hunt when they're doing that? And how high can they actually jump out of the water? So it depends on the age and the size of the croc. Um, as I mentioned before, when we were feeding using that tail walk technique, um, they do that more so when they're young. When they're feeding on things like small water, water birds that may be roosting in a branch over the water, um, flying fox, things of that nature that they need to get up out of the water um, to obtain. Now, um, when they're smaller, you know, a metre, metre and a half, two metres, they can actually propel their entire body out of the water. I've seen video footage of reasonably small five, six foot crocs um, getting their entire body out of the water. But for the most part, as a general rule, they can get um, about two thirds of their body out of that water. And that includes Elvis. We have seen on the odd occasion him um, come up to about the base of his tail during that uh, tail walk. There's some old wives tales out there if you run in a zigzag pattern to get away from crocodiles that it works. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> I think if I were being, uh, oh, we could get an example of this. <laughs> we might hop out here, I think. <laughs> oh. All right. 
So if I were getting away from a croc, as we just had to, um, what I would be doing is moving in a straight uh, line, of course, because you are going to be able to do that far quicker than if you were moving from side to side. You're not really covering a whole heap of ground if you're doing that. Um, so if you do find yourself in a position close to a croc, um, don't worry about zigzags, just get away from it in a, a bee line, as are they, you normally would. Are they quite quick out of the water, and what are their speeds like in the water? Um, so in the water, extremely quick. They can actually move um, and not far off the speed of a dolphin. So um, extremely quick and extremely dangerous in the water. But as you can see, once he's in this position that he is in now, where he's primarily out of the water, he's about two thirds out of the water now, He's quite slow and uh, there's good reason for that. He's got very short stumpy legs off to the side, um, a big quite round belly and uh, of course a very very thick heavy tail which acts as a bit of a handbrake. So um, when they're out of the water, reasonably slow. That's not to say they don't um, move around out of the water. If they have to move from river system to river system they will do that. Um, but they're not ever utilising the land in order to uh, catch their prey. They do all of that from the water's edge. Do they have good eyesight? Uh, they do, yes. So, um, extremely good eyesight, um, an extremely good sense of smell. And as I mentioned before, as I was drawing the croc in using those vibrations, they can feel vibrations through their tiny pressure receptors, which we call ISOs or integumentary sense organs. And this is something that all the crocodilians uh, will have. It differs a bit. Uh, for example, on an American alligator, you'll typically only see them on the face and the head. Um, on a saltwater croc, they've got one on virtually every scale. So incredibly sensitive to those um, vibrations through the water, but very good eyesight, very good sense of smell. And you'll notice when they pop up on top of the water, um, what you'll see is their, uh, basically their nostrils, their eyes and their ears, they all lay on the same horizontal plane. So when they pop to the surface, they can hear, see and smell whilst remaining almost completely uh, hidden beneath the water. So we can see from this angle, and I don't want to get too much closer because we are outside now, but he's got a pretty good set of chompers on him. So his teeth are, are pretty attractive for a crocodile, that is. Do you want to go through, you know, the teeth structure of a crocodile and can they replace them if they lose them? Yeah, absolutely. So Elvis is a bit of a, an odd example in the fact that he has extremely large uh, teeth. And this is just obviously something genetic that's gone on. Um, he has very large, very impressive teeth. Um, I have seen crocs similar length and similar weight to Elvis that have teeth half the size. So um, it's something that's quite uh, unique to Elvis. This isn't always the case. And the teeth can actually uh, replace throughout their life. So they might go through two or 3,000 teeth um, in their lifetime. Eventually that does stop um, when they hit a certain age they can't replace the teeth and what you end up with is an old croc maybe 80 or 90 years of age um, with no teeth whatsoever which then becomes very very hard for them to uh, grip prey but when they're in the prime of their life they're replacing those teeth as they're uh, falling out and they may fall out for a number of reasons uh, one is just wear and tear if it wears down too small maybe it's got a big crack in it then it might just fall out but sometimes when they hit a really big food item they might hit a bit of bone then they can snap out as well so it just depends on the scenario but they do grow back when they're a younger healthier crop a few more questions um underwater how long can they can they breathe underwater um how long can they hold their breath for yeah so they they can't breathe underwater like you know, a fish can um, they do need to come to the surface in order to take a breath but they can go for extended periods on a single dive um, so in the case of a saltwater crocodile you would be typically talking about between potentially three and four hours a very very long time when they're not stressed um, they're just kind of calmly uh, moving to the surface going back down there may be two or three potentially four hours between those um, events of sinking and coming back up. Now in the case of the smaller Australian species, the freshwater crocodile, they have been known to uh, go down on a single dive for over seven hours. So um, it does depend on the species and the size of the croc a bit, but regardless, a very, very long time and certainly uh, enough to dispatch any mammal that they may have in their jaw. As you can imagine, if this croc here's grabbed a, a wallaby and they take it to the bottom, that wallaby will be extremely stressed and uh, it will likely uh, pass in a matter of minutes. Elvis or any saltwater croc will just sit there, wait for that, and then begin to uh, go about the process of consuming it. How many species of crocodiles or crocodilian are there in the world and which one is the biggest? So there's about 27 species of croc 
or crocodilian found throughout the world. There's a few different uh, family. So you have your true crocodiles like Elvis here and the saltwater croc. Um, then you also have alligators. We have the American alligator here at the park, but there is also a Chinese alligator, they're a bit smaller. And then you have uh, gharial from primarily Nepal and India, your true gharial. And then you do also have caiman from South America and a number of species. So um, there's four main groups of crocodilian and in total there's about 27. Now here in Australia, we do only have two. They're both true crocs, the saltwater crocodile and the freshwater crocodile. Two fairly different species in terms of uh, their body proportions. The freshwater crocodile is one of the smaller crocs found throughout the world. Only reaches about three meters total length. They have a very long skinny jaw structure and they have very sharp teeth because they are primarily designed for feeding on fish. Um, they're a fish eating croc. There's a number of other fish eating crocs throughout the world. Um, but it just so happens that the saltwater crocodile has a broader, uh, much more powerful jaw in order for feeding on those uh, mammals that they're designed to feed on. So would you say that the saltwater crocodile is the largest species of crocodile in the entire world? That is correct. There's a few species that do come close, um, a few that do exceed five metres in length. Um, but as it stands, the, the record goes to the saltwater crocodile and actually a croc um, that was found in the Philippines. So despite being found in the Philippines, still the same species, they're found right throughout much of Southeast Asia, into India, and then of course, um, throughout Northern Australia. So we've had a few questions. We might make this one our last one about breeding and eggs and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So do you just want to finish up today on going through the breeding process for a saltwater crocodile? Yeah, absolutely. So whilst they are, of course, um, quite a formidable predator. Um, when it comes to females, some male saltwater crocs can be um, very, very gentle, very loving, um, quite romantic. And you typically see that um, in a captive situation, you can have pairs of saltwater crocs that live together all their lives and they'll breed um, year after year and they love each other. Very cute. Um, but in the case of uh, Elvis, of course, that's not the case. He doesn't love a female. We've got no female in here with him. He's just by himself. And that just happens with male crocs even in the wild. Now in the wild, if we're talking about uh, coming together and breeding, what will often happen is you may have um, a number of crocs within a given section of the river. The males will sometimes come together and fight over the females. They'll lift their heads out of the water right next to each other. They smash their heads together. And essentially what's gonna happen is the more uh, dominant larger male typically is then going to get uh, to breed with the, the best females. So they'll do that, they'll mate, they'll breed, and then those females will eventually head up onto land and begin to construct a nest. Now the nest is basically a mound. Um, they'll use sticks, leaves, debris from the water's edge. They drag it up, they make a mound, and then when they're ready, they'll lay the eggs inside that mound. Now they might have between 60, 70 eggs potentially, and uh, they're about a fair bit bigger than a chicken egg, about that large and they incubate for about 60, 65 days. Now at the end of that period, um, those babies will hopefully hatch out. There is quite a lot of um, predators for an unhatched croc. Um, for example, goannas, feral pig. These are all animals that can go to a croc's nest, find it, dig up those uh, eggs and consume them. So if they do get to hatch, um, that's fantastic. And then they'll uh, make their way down to the water. They'll hang out in shallow water for a period of time, uh, potentially with the female close by. And then of course they'll begin to grow. Many of them will be picked off within the, their first year. The survival rate or the chances of a, a saltwater croc getting to the size of Elvis is extremely few in the wild. So um, they've got a lot of trials that they need to get through first, but hopefully they can get through that. Um, they'll begin to grow. And uh, of course the males eventually will um, start to prove if they're dominant or not. And they may end up as that top croc in that section of the river system. All right, guys, I think we're going to uh, finish up there. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, got to see Elvis do his thing. He was quite cheeky today, which we don't always see. Um, quite unusual for the time of year as well. It is starting to cool down, um, but of course his water is heated, so um, he was still fairly energetic today. Hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you next time. Stay safe. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.